You've probably seen Hollywood movies where somehow a small hole opens up in the side of a plane and then immediately it's utter chaos. Food trays and bags flying, seat belts barely holding passengers in place. Luckily, in reality, small damage to the fuselage won't cause such dramatic consequences. But would you believe me if I told you there was a pilot that managed to land a plane with half the roof torn completely off? Buckle up. At 1.25 p.m. on April 28, 1988, a 19-year-old Boeing 737 that belonged to Aloha Airlines left Hilo International Airport and headed for Honolulu. The plane was named after Queen Liliokalani, who was the last sovereign monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii. On that day, the aircraft already had three short flights from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai. Apologies to the people of Hawaii for any mispronounced names. Anyway, all the trips were regular and uneventful. The weather was calm, and it seemed like nothing could go wrong. The captain was experienced pilot Robert Shorns Timer, 44 years old, who had 6,700 flight hours in the Boeing 737. The first officer was Madeline Tompkins, 36 years old, who had flown more than 3,500 hours in the very same Boeing model. Early in the morning, still in Honolulu, the first officer had conducted the regular pre-flight inspection and announced that the plane was ready for the flight. At 11 a.m., the plane left Honolulu and headed for Maui and then to Hilo. When the plane arrived at the destination, the pilots didn't leave the cockpit or inspect the aircraft from the outside. After all, it wasn't a requirement, so they didn't have to. Following schedule, the plane started the last leg on the routine round trip at 1.25 p.m. There were 95 people on board the aircraft, 89 passengers, two pilots, three flight attendants, and an FAA traffic controller who stayed in the observer seat in the cockpit. After a normal takeoff and ascent, the plane got to the usual cruising altitude of 24,000 feet, and then, at about 1.48 p.m., 26 miles away from Kaolui, the unexpected happened. Those who were in the cockpit heard a loud whooshing sound and then a crack, followed by the deafening sound of wind seconds later. Apparently, a small part of the roof on the left side tore loose, which led to the explosive decompression of the plane. But the worst thing was that the decompression caused a ripple effect, which led to a huge section of the airplane's roof to tear off completely. The length of the missing part was 18.5 feet long. It was all part of the aircraft's skin that covered the plane from the cockpit back to the four-wing area. At first, the pilots didn't realize what had happened. The first officer, who was in control of the aircraft at that moment, felt her head jerk backward, and she noticed debris and gray pieces of insulation flying chaotically around the cockpit. When the captain turned his head, he saw that the cockpit door had disappeared, and instead of the first-class ceiling, he was staring at a clear blue sky. The plane started to roll from side to side, and it was becoming increasingly harder to control. Everybody who was in the cockpit immediately put on their oxygen masks, and the captain took over the aircraft. He prod the speed brakes into action, and began an emergency descent towards the nearest airport, which was on Maui Island. Luckily, all the passengers were in their seats at the moment when the accident happened, and since the seatbelt sight was still on, everyone had their seatbelts fastened. However, all three flight attendants were standing along the aircraft aisle. The one who was the closest to the front of the plane was swept out through the hole in the roof. The other two were thrown to the floor by a forceful jerk. But while one of them hit her head really hard and lost consciousness, the other one started to crawl along the aisle in an attempt to help passengers and calm them down. At that same time, the pilots were trying to contact air traffic control and signal an emergency. To make matters worse, they couldn't hear each other and had to use gestures to communicate. They also didn't know whether the radio worked and whether they had managed to deliver their message. The flight controls were sluggish and loose, and the captain was struggling to control the plane. The first officer, right by his side, dealing with communication and assisting the captain. It turned out that the controller hadn't been receiving the crew's messages until the aircraft descended to the altitude of 14,000 feet. Only then did the signal get through and Maui Tower started urgent preparations for an emergency landing. The problem was that at that time, in case of an emergency, the airport control tower had to dial 911 just like anyone else. 
On top of that, the controller didn't catch that the passengers and crew members would need medical help. After all, the crew only announced that they had experienced a rapid decompression, so the controller wasn't aware of the entire gravity of the situation. In the meantime, the plane had already dropped to a height of 10,000 feet above sea level. The captain removed his oxygen mask and withdrew the speed brakes. The plane was steadily descending toward runway 2 of Kowalui Airport. Following the captain's command, the first officer lowered the landing gear, but the indicator light didn't come on. That could mean that either they had a bad light, or they had serious problems with the nose gear. But that wasn't the only problem. As the plane was approaching the runway, the left engine failed, and the aircraft started rocking and shaking. The captain made an attempt to restart the engine, but didn't succeed. And yet still, with the help of the reverse thrust of the second still working engine, at 1.58 p.m., just 10 minutes after the emergency and 35 minutes after the takeoff, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 did manage to touch down on the runway of Kaolui Airport and come to a complete stop. Landing a plane with such a huge loss of integrity was an unprecedented feat. As soon as the plane stopped, the evacuation began. Everyone on the plane, except for the one flight attendant who had been pulled out of the plane, was alive, although 65 people were injured. Most people had been hurt by flying debris and torn pieces of fuselage. Unfortunately, since nobody on the ground had known how serious the situation was, no ambulances were waiting for the injured. The first one arrived seven minutes after the plane landed, and there were only two ambulances on the entire island, which obviously couldn't fit all the people. That's why the passengers had to be transported to the hospital in several 15-passenger tour vans that belonged to the company Akamai Tours. Luckily, two Akamai drivers used to be paramedics, so they started to tend to the injured right on the runway. Meanwhile, airport mechanics, as well as office staff, drove the vans to the hospital, which was three miles away. Luckily, there were only eight serious injuries, from which all of these passengers later recovered. As for the plane, it was damaged beyond repair and later dismantled right at the airport. The missing part of the roof disappeared and was never seen again. But what could cause such a terrible accident? The problem wasn't the age of the aircraft. 19 years isn't that old for a commercial plane. And it hadn't accumulated too many flight hours before the accident happened. But the 35,500 flight hours the plane had traveled included 89,680 takeoffs and landings, which are also called flight cycles. The reason for such a huge number was that the plane performed mostly short domestic flights between the islands. And this number exceeded the number of flight cycles the plane was designed for twice over. Besides, the plane traveled in a salty and humid environment, which also added to the wear and tear. Interestingly, during one interview that followed the accident, passenger Gail Yamamoto remembered that she had spotted a crack in the fuselage when she was boarding. Unfortunately, she was the only one who had seen the damage, and the woman hadn't thought that the crack was important enough to inform the crew. It's important to stress that these kinds of accidents are extremely rare these days. According to Harvard University, given all the steps and measures major airlines and airports take to ensure safety, the odds of you being in an airplane accident is roughly 1 in 1.2 million. That's a 0.000083% chance. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. And even if something were to happen, like, for example, half the roof falling off, it's a great comfort to know that your trained pilots can still land the plane relatively safely. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. We've all heard of the famous story of the sinking of the Titanic. But if you really think about it, it's not just one story, but so many stories all at once. It is a story of strength and courage, as with the likes of Margaret Brown stepping in to help passengers in need. It is a story of luck and guile, like with Arthur John Priest, a man who not only survived the Titanic, but also three other tragedies at sea. It is a story of perseverance and intrigue, as with Violet Jessup, a stewardess who had also survived three shipwrecks and then continued to serve for 30 more years after that. These are the stories of their personal journeys. 
When the RMS Titanic set sail from England on April 10, 1912, it was the largest ship ever built at its time. It was 883 feet long and 175 feet tall, and it took 3,000 workers 26 months to build it. Considered to be the pinnacle of nautical engineering, this ship was touted by its makers to be unsinkable. Of course, four days after its maiden voyage at sea, that claim would be proven false. On April 14th, the Titanic hit the iceberg. The collision ruptured the hull, and the 16 supposedly watertight compartments designed to keep the ship afloat quickly flooded with water. It took the liner two hours and 40 minutes to sink. And of the 2,240 passengers and crew on board, only 706 survived. One of those survivors was Margaret Brown. She was a philanthropist, an actress, who had traveled to Europe to visit her daughter in Paris. However, when Brown got word that a grandchild had fallen ill back in America, she bought a ticket for the next available ocean liner that would take her home, which just so happened to be the Titanic. As a wealthy woman, whose husband had become rich after finding gold in one of the mines that he owned, Brown was able to get first-class accommodations on the vessel. For over four days, she enjoyed many of the luxuries that came with her ticket. There were the expected services, like a large dining room with a live orchestra. But the vessel also was equipped with a gym, squash courts, and a swimming pool. And she'd spend her time in the first-class lounge that had been designed in the architectural style of the Palace of Versailles. When the Titanic started to sink, Brown could have jumped into the first available lifeboat and made her way to safety but she did not. Instead, she joined the relief efforts and helped others get out, putting her own life at risk. In fact, by some accounts, a crew member had to physically pick her up and drop her into a lifeboat, number six, in order to get her off the ship. With all the confusion and fear around, Brown went on to take control of the lifeboat. She even got the women on board to help paddle, knowing that it would help them keep warm in the cold night's air. There were also reports that she had an argument with the crewman who was in charge of that particular boat. When she suggested that they paddle toward the ship to help save others, quartermaster Robert Hitchens refused, claiming that when the massive Titanic would finally go under, their tiny lifeboat would be pulled down with it if they were too close. An hour and 20 minutes after the Titanic sank, the survivors were finally rescued by the RMS Carpathia. Even then, Brown was still hard at work, now ensuring that passengers from the second and third classes were provided with basic necessities, such as food and blankets. Initially dubbed the heroine of the Titanic, she would later be nicknamed the unsinkable Molly Brown. A bit of an odd nickname, considering that she was never called Molly in her normal life. However, her story was so compelling that it was eventually turned into a musical in 1960 and into a movie in 1964 and her character would continue to pop up in several other films about the tragedy. There was also another person on board who was also later declared unsinkable, though his series of events that led to him earning this title are far more tragic. His real name was Arthur John Priest. He worked as a stoker and fireman. This meant that he spent most of his time below deck, helping shovel coal into the furnaces that created the steam needed to keep the ship moving. It was a dirty, sweaty job, but it was also a big responsibility, as stokers had to ensure the furnaces did not overheat or set fire to the whole ship. Priest was one of the 163 stokers hired to work on the Titanic for his first big trip. He helped shovel the 600 tons of coal the engines needed each day. When the ship hit the iceberg, Priest was relaxing in the bunker he shared with his co-workers, not far from his workstation. Escape was difficult and his chances of survival were low. He had to move fast, running through corridors and uh, along gangplanks, as he made a desperate dash onto the deck. And once there, he had only one option left, to jump into the frigid Atlantic Ocean. Imagine the shock of being enveloped by 27 degree water, surrounded by panicked screams and the darkness of the night. Despite all this, Priest swam, and swam, and remarkably, frostbite setting in, he found safety on a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive. As if that wasn't enough, 
Priest would go on to survive three other sinking ship disasters, including the HMS Alcantara in 1916, the Titanic sister ship the Britannic, also in 1916, and then the Donegal in 1917. It was for this miraculous record that he was later known as the Unsinkable Stoker. After the Donegal, Priest finally retired from working on ships. Although he claimed he only did so because nobody would agree to sail with him. Now, people who had been in a shipwreck often remain afraid of water for the rest of their lives. But let me tell you a story of a woman who survived not one, not two, but three ship disasters and then continued to work on cruise liners as a stewardess. Meet Violet Jessup, Miss Unsinkable. Her childhood can be described in one word, short. Violet had to grow up very quickly to take care of her siblings. She was the oldest of nine children. Life became even more difficult when she became very ill. The doctors were sure that she wouldn't survive, but she did. Shortly after recovering, she moved to England with her mother, took care of her sisters, and attended a convent school. Her mother worked as a stewardess at sea, and when she fell sick, young Violet followed in her footsteps. But because of her youth and beauty, no one wanted to hire her, thinking that she would distract passengers and crew. But Violet didn't give up, and instead came to one of the interviews in her worst clothes and with unkempt hair. She wanted to show that she was ready for hard work on the ship. She was hired on the spot. The first two years passed uneventfully. But then, a series of incredible fortunes began, or misfortunes, depending on how you look at it. In 1910, Miss Jessup got a job on the most luxurious liner of its time, the Royal Mail Ship Olympic. This ship sailed across the Atlantic from England to America. The engineers didn't focus on the speed of this vessel, but on its comfort. While working on that ship, Jessup was paid just two pounds a month, the same as 200 pounds today. Hard work on the ship's deck from morning to night didn't frighten Jessup. She loved the job. She liked to talk to the people and enjoyed the beautiful views of the Atlantic. So on September 20th, 1911, Jessup was working on the deck as usual. The sea was calm and the weather was excellent. The ship was sailing through the Solent Strait, which separates the Isle of Wight from the British mainland. At this moment, the British military cruiser Hawk appeared ahead. It should have simply passed by the Olympic, but something went wrong. For whatever reason, the ships started going straight at each other. The Olympic's captain tried to maneuver to avoid a collision, but failed. The Hawk's bow was designed specifically to ram other ships, so when it rammed the Olympic, it made an impact. The liner shuddered, and the people screamed in fear and panic. The ship had a huge hole in the starboard. Jessup fell from the force of the blow it seemed that one of the biggest liners of its time was going to sink. But luckily, both ships stayed afloat and nobody got hurt. You would think that an accident like this would frighten Jessup, but nope, she didn't give it a second thought and it continued to work as a stewardess. In April of 1912, she decided to take a job on the best, most unsinkable ship of its time, where she was supposed to serve VIPs. Initially, she didn't want to work on this ship, only agreeing to it after much persuasion from her friends. And that's how Violet Jessup boarded the Titanic on April 10, 1912. Four days later, when the infamous iceberg collided with the ship, Jessup was resting in her cabin. She was almost asleep when she felt the jolt. Immediately, she was called to the upper deck. Surprisingly, when the Titanic first hit the iceberg, almost nobody panicked. No one could believe that the unsinkable ship could actually sink. As the ship's hold was being filled with water, everybody was just calmly carrying on about their business on the upper decks. It was only when the cabin crew started instructing passengers to reach their lifeboats that panic finally set in. Jessup, along with other stewards, was actively aiding the passengers' evacuation to the lifeboats. The rule was that women and children were to be evacuated first. But when many of the women hesitated to step onto the lifeboats, delaying the crew's efforts, one of the ship's officers ordered Jessup to get into a boat to show the other women it was perfectly safe. Soon, others followed, and then someone suddenly thrust a swaddled baby into her hands. Without a second thought, Jessup hugged the child to her chest to keep it warm while the Titanic was sinking. 
She didn't let go of the baby until her lifeboat was picked up by the Carpathia, the ship that came to the rescue. As Jessup boarded the ship with the baby, a woman ran up to her and without saying a word, snatched the child from Jessup's hands. I mean, she assumed the woman was the baby's mother, so she didn't try to get it back. She was too numb and frozen to think how strange it was this woman hadn't even said thank you for saving her baby. Many years later, Jessup would be reminded of this baby under some mysterious circumstances. After successfully surviving one of the most terrible shipwrecks in history, Jessup, of course, continued to work at sea. In 1916, she took a job as a nurse on the hospital ship Britannic, which you might remember as the sister ship to both the Olympic and the Titanic. Except this one sailed in the Aegean Sea. On November 21st, the ship was traveling down its very familiar route, but on that particular day, luck was not on its side. This would become the third shipwreck Jessup will have survived. However, this rescue wasn't as easy as the previous two. After the accident, the huge Britannic began to sink quickly. It took less than an hour for the ship to completely sink. Jessup didn't have time to board a lifeboat this time, so she jumped into the cold water. There, she swam to the closest lifeboat and got on. But then everyone on the boat noticed that the ship's propellers were still working. They were spinning in the water, creating a whirlpool that was pulling the boat toward them. Jessup jumped off the boat just in time to escape the propellers, but her ordeal was far from over. While in the water, she was pulled down to the ship's keel and hit her head. The only thing that saved her from losing consciousness and probably her life was her thick hair slightly cushioning the impact. And so, somehow, against all odds, Jessup got away from the engine and was soon picked up by another boat. For the next few years after this accident, Jessup was plagued by headaches. When she finally went to the doctor, he told her she was incredibly lucky to still be alive. The incident on the Britannic resulted in a fracture in her skull. You would think that three shipwrecks and a fractured skull would be enough to stop anyone, but not Violet Jessup. She continued to work on cruise ships until the year 1950. She even cruised on the world twice on the luxury liner Belgenland. Fortunately, the rest of Miss Jessup's career went without any further mishaps. In 1950, she moved to Great Ashfield in Suffolk County, having worked at sea for almost 42 years. Content with her career, she settled in a large cottage built in the 16th century. But a year into her retirement, she received a strange phone call. It was late at night, and Jessup was asleep when the phone rang. She picked up the phone and heard a woman's voice on the other end. The lady didn't introduce herself and asked right away, Excuse me, was it you who saved a baby on the Titanic? Jessup answered, Yes, it was me. She laughed and hung up. <laughs> Jessup later told her friend about this strange call. She assumed that some kids were playing a joke on her, but Jessup had never told anyone about the baby before that call. And according to the old records, the only child who was on the boat with Jessup was a boy. But those same records also said that the boy had been saved by another passenger. To this day, it's still unknown who the baby that Jessup rescued was. Either way, for surviving three different wrecks on three different ships, she was aptly dubbed Miss Unsinkable. And there you have it. Three incredible stories of three remarkable individuals. And there's many more like them. Stories like these prove there's a hero in all of us that can come out in unexpected circumstances. But of course, I hope you'll never need to put that theory to the test. See you next time, and uh, safe travels. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. You have heard about Nikola Tesla. You have definitely heard about the Great Pyramids in Egypt. But what if I told you that Tesla may have probably uncovered the ancient mystery surrounding the pyramids? Wait, what? Is this a crossover episode? Nope. It's highly probable that the secrets of the pyramids are hidden in plain sight.
But first, let's recap what we know about the pyramids. What's so mysterious about them? I mean, they are just old quirky buildings, aren't they? One of the biggest questions is how they were built. Some people think that the pyramids were created by people using only their hands and muscles. But others think that there might have been some kind of crazy energy source that we don't know about yet. Like what if aliens helped out or something? Just kidding. But this idea of some unknown energy source being used to build the pyramids has been around for ages. Even in old texts, like the pyramid texts, it talks about how the gods gave us something to build a great power. So maybe there was something really powerful and mysterious going on back then? Who knows? Back in the early 1900s, he got obsessed with the Great Pyramids of Egypt. He read numerous books about these ancient structures and was blown away by how much energy they seemed to have. At that time, not many people knew much about electricity, and Tesla started to wonder if there was some kind of advanced tech hidden in the pyramids. He had an idea that the power of the pyramids had to do with electromagnetism, and he put a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out the mystery. Tesla had some pretty unusual theories about the Great Pyramids. He thought that they could actually store and move electricity, which could then be used to power up the areas around them. He also had this theory that the pyramids were built using some kind of crystal energy. He believed that the chambers inside the pyramids could have these super powerful crystals that could control the electromagnetic fields. But that's not all. Tesla also had this idea that the materials used to make the pyramids had properties that allowed them to trap energy from the sun and the moon. And not just a little bit of energy. He thought that the pyramid could actually create this massive energy field that could light up whole cities or even brighten up dark places. He thought that the pyramids could be used as giant power plants to generate electricity and run machines. Tesla even believed that the pyramids were somehow linked to cosmic energy, which could be used for spiritual enlightenment and healing. How very new age of him. Anyway, Tesla wasn't just pulling these ideas out of thin air. He was seriously into studying everything he could about the pyramids, from ancient artifacts and texts to hieroglyphs and drawings. And he came up with this idea that the pyramids were designed to be energy amplifiers, and some kind of unknown energy source was used during their construction. Some people thought Tesla was eccentric for coming up with these theories, but his ideas have actually had a huge impact on the way we think about the pyramids today. Researchers and scholars have been digging into his theories for years and using them to uncover some of the biggest mysteries surrounding these ancient structures. For example, recently scientists have used theoretical physics to investigate how the Great Pyramid of Egypt would react to certain radio waves. They found out that if the radio waves were a certain length, the pyramid could concentrate the energy inside its rooms and focus it under its base. The scientists did lots of calculations to figure this out. They first thought about what radio wavelengths would work best. Then they made a model of how the pyramid would react to the waves. They figured out how much of the energy from the waves would get absorbed or spread out. Lastly, they checked how the energy would move around inside the pyramid when the waves hit it. To help explain all of this, the scientists used something called multipole analysis. This is when you take a complicated object and break it down into simpler parts. Then you can see how each part interacts with the energy that's coming in. It's like taking apart a puzzle to see how each piece fits together. The researchers are interested in how all of this can be used in the future. They want to make really tiny particles that can do the same thing as the pyramid, but with light. By changing the size, shape, and the material of these particles, they can control how the light moves around them. This can be really useful for things like making tiny sensors or super efficient solar cells. The scientists had to make some guesses when they were doing their research. They assumed that there weren't any hidden spaces inside the pyramid and that the material used to build it was all the same. But even with these guesses, they still made some pretty impressive discoveries. But the pyramid study is not the only proof that Tesla was ahead of his time. There are more Tesla's projects that seemed unrealistic at the time but that scientists and enthusiasts reevaluate and try to implement today. Let's talk about Tesla's most ambitious project, the Wardenclyffe Transmission Tower. 
Back in 1900, Tesla was already a big shot when it came to electrical engineering in America. People were blown away by his amazing inventions and the fact that he managed to outdo Thomas Edison in the battle of currents. However, Tesla wasn't content to rest on his laurels. He decided to embark on his most ambitious project yet, the transmission tower at Wardenclyffe. It was built between 1901 and 1905, and it was based on one of Tesla's breakthrough ideas. He had a vision to make the impossible possible by creating a global wireless communication system. It would use Earth itself as a conductor, transmitting music, news, stock market reports, secured military communications, and even facsimile images. Does it sound familiar? Right, it sounds just like the internet that we use today, only without the use of any wires. But Tesla had a much bigger dream in mind, to transmit power wirelessly. He already proved that high-frequency signals could be sent without any wires using his Tesla coil transformers, and this sparked his obsession with wireless energy transmission. His vision was to not only transform the way we communicate, but also to find a way to transfer power currents globally by tapping into the Earth's natural energy. Tesla believed that there was an abundance of free energy all around us that could be used for humanity's benefit. In 1899, he conducted some top-secret experiments and got convinced that it was possible to transmit electrical power through the Earth's upper atmosphere. This is actually how the Wardenclyffe Tower was created. It was supposed to be the prototype station for a network of towers all over the globe that would provide the whole world with wireless energy. Unfortunately, Tesla didn't have the resources or the patience of his investors to bring this project to fruition. It ran into all sorts of financial problems and roadblocks, and in 1917, the unfinished tower was finally torn down for scrap metal to pay off Tesla's mounting debts. Now it remains a sad reminder that even the greatest minds can sometimes fall short of their dreams. The original red brick laboratory, however, is still there, and it is the only Tesla lab that has survived. Fun fact, in 2017, a film crew made a crazy discovery. They used ground-penetrating radar to explore the area around Wardenclyffe, and they found a whole series of tunnels stretching for hundreds of feet underneath the site. Nobody knows exactly what these tunnels were used for, but people have been speculating for years that they were part of Tesla's grand plan. Wardenclyffe, of course, is a major landmark for Tesla enthusiasts from all over the world. Who knows, maybe someone will finally crack the mystery of the tunnels one day. But even if they don't, the legacy of Tesla and his amazing ideas lives on. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. The night was dark and scary. A few hundred people were sitting in lifeboats, not knowing what would happen next or what their lives would look like from that moment on. All they knew was the giant ship they had been sailing on just a couple of hours earlier disappeared in front of their eyes. They were alone, waiting for help. Is anyone even coming? They had no idea if the rest of the ships that were traveling relatively close to them had heard their call for help. There was nothing else to do but wait. The Titanic, an iceberg, and one night, April 14th, 1912. It's one of the most famous stories from modern history that everyone talks about, even now, more than 100 years later. The 16 lifeboats on board could only accommodate a little more than 50%, 1,178 people, of the total number of passengers that were on board. And many of them were still half empty. In one of them, there was a little two-month-old girl, Milvina Dean, the youngest passenger on board the giant ship. Her parents had decided to leave England because they wanted to build a better life in the United States. Her father had some family in Kansas, and he hoped they could start their own business there. The Dean family didn't actually choose to be on board this giant legendary liner, but because of a coal strike, they got transferred there. So they boarded it at Southampton as third-class passengers. Milvina's father felt when their ship hit the iceberg on that cold and seemingly peaceful night. He immediately went up to investigate. When he saw that people were panicking and that the crew members were giving warnings on the actual danger of the situation, he rushed to their cabin to find his wife. He told her to dress the children and quickly go up on deck. The crew members gave the order to get the lifeboats ready and start transferring women and children there first. It was a chance for at least some family members to get to safety. 
Milvina, her mother, and her brother got in Lifeboat 10. They were among the first off the liner out of the 706 crew members and passengers who managed to escape the sinking ship. Later, the liner called Carpathia heard their call for help, came for the passengers, and took them to New York. Her father, unfortunately, stayed behind them and didn't manage to save himself. Milvina grew up in Ashurst, England, which wasn't far from where she set sail on the ship. She spent her life working as a secretary and an assistant in small businesses in Southampton. She never married. Milvina always used to say she never spoke about the whole Titanic thing because she remembered nothing about it, so she didn't want people to think she was just drawing attention to herself. But in 1985, a French-American team got together and located the wreck of the Titanic. It was around 370 miles east of Mistaken Point, Newfoundland, in water that was more than two miles deep. That's when they confirmed the ship split in two. For decades, people believed the ship sank in one piece. They thought the only significant damage was the damage the hull got from its contact with the iceberg. In reality, it broke in half, right between its third and fourth funnels. It happened shortly before the ship disappeared under the surface of the water, and the whole thing, starting from the moment when they hit the iceberg, lasted around 2 hours and 40 minutes. People didn't pay that much attention to the Titanic until this team of researchers found the wreck. In the last year of her life, she sold some of her family's possessions at auction to pay for her stay in a nursing home. The items she sold also included a suitcase filled with clothes that her family got when they arrived in the U.S. and compensation letters her mom got from the Titanic Relief Fund. The compensation letters outlined the financial aid that certain passengers received who had survived the loss of their loved ones. She lived until the age of 97 when she caught pneumonia. She was the youngest of the 705 people that survived the whole event. The Titanic was the world's largest ship. Since it was so big, some thought the vessel should have had four exhaust stacks. But Thomas Andrews, the man who designed the ship, believed that only three were necessary. So the Titanic basically had one purely decorative stack. 2,200 people were on board when the ship sank. There were 908 crew members and the maximum number of passengers on board, which was 3,500. As you probably saw in the movie, there were different classes of passengers. The estimated overall wealth of those in first class was about $500 million. And researchers estimated $6 million worth of things went down to the ocean bottom, together with the ship. In first class, this liner was a place of luxury. It had four restaurants, two libraries, two barber shops, reading rooms, and a photographic darkroom on board. There was also a heated swimming pool, but only first class passengers could use it at a price of one shilling a time. The ship also had Turkish baths and electric baths, and passengers could use each for four shillings at a time. The cost to build this massive giant was $7.5 million, but that was back in 1912. Today, it would be about $200 million. First class tickets cost $2,560 at the time, which is today's equivalent of $61,000. What would you get in these expensive cabins? A sitting room, two bedrooms, two wardrobe rooms, and a bathroom. Hmm, would you pay that much for those luxuries? Teams of researchers still haven't explored many areas on the Titanic. It's still very, very hard to access them with underwater vehicles. There was a lifeboat drill scheduled for the same day the Titanic sank, but it was called off for some reason. The crew had done just one lifeboat drill, and that was when the ship was still docked. But even if the crew members had been properly trained and each lifeboat had been filled, the capacity was still not enough to save each and every passenger. The Titanic was the biggest movable object in the world at that time. On May 31, 1911, its immense hull made its way down the slipways and ended up in the River Lagan in Belfast. Over 100,000 people were there to see the launch which took just a little more than a minute and went off without a hitch. The people who were in charge of the ship immediately towed the hull to a mammoth fitting out dock. Thousands of workers spent most of the next year there working hard, building the decks and constructing all those luxury interiors that gave the Titanic its specific look. 
They were also installing the 29 giant boilers that would power the ship's two main steam engines. All that to get the title unsinkable. The ship had more than just one fatal flaw. You may have heard of one of its design flaws. The airtight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed water to flow from one compartment to another, which eventually sank the liner. And Titanic had more flaws. High sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds largely affected the steel of the vessel's hull and the iron of its rivets. The steel here shattered, while the rivets popped out relatively easily. This was the reason the Titanic sunk 24 times faster than we'd expect. There are many theories about what really led to the sinking of such a giant. And one says a full moon from a couple of months before could be one of the reasons. It may have created very strong tides that sent a flotilla of icebergs southward. This was right in time for the Titanic's maiden voyage. Research says an optical illusion prevented the ship from getting help. One famous British historian, Tim Malton, thought the atmosphere on the night of the sinking created specific conditions that made it very hard for the crew members to spot icebergs. They partially caused something called super refraction. The extraordinary bending of light causes miraging, and several ships in the area recorded it. Not only did this prevent the crew from seeing the troublesome iceberg in time, but it also stopped one of the ships that could have offered help from identifying the call for help and communicating with the Titanic crew. Also, some say the ship was traveling too fast. From the start, they blamed the skipper for sailing such a big liner at such a high speed, 22 knots, through the cold and unpredictable waters of the North Atlantic, which was full of hidden icebergs. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are the richest people in the world at the moment. But if you put all their money together, this amount won't be anywhere near the wealth of the richest person in history. Meet Mansa Musa, the richest man who ever lived. He has held first place in the top riches for more than 700 years, and it's unlikely that somebody will be able to reach his wealth level in the near future. Jeff Bezos has about $203 billion. Elon Musk owns more than $300 billion. Mansa Musa, translated into today's money, had an incalculable wealth. The most conservative estimates suggest that he had more than $400 to $500 billion. However, this is only a hypothesis. Most historians believe he was unimaginably rich and powerful, and this wealth destroyed his country's economy. But let's start from the beginning. Mansa Musa was born in 1280 in West Africa, in the country of Mali, the present-day Republic of Mali. His whole family consisted of rulers, so he spent his childhood and youth in luxury. Almost all this time, his elder brother ruled the country. And then, when Mansa Musa turned 32, his brother abdicated. He wanted to explore the world and was obsessed with the Atlantic Ocean and the lands that lay beyond it. He assembled a huge expedition of 2,000 ships and tens of thousands of people. They sailed like a whole city on the water and never came back. Some historians believe that Mansa Musa's brother managed to reach South America, but there is no true evidence of this. So, young Mansa Musa became the ruler of Mali and the owner of all the family wealth in 1312. He was a good ruler and a smart strategist. In the first years of his reign, he managed to annex about 24 cities. He united disparate small states into one empire. He greatly expanded the kingdom of Mali. It extended about 2,000 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. He owned almost the entire western part of the continent. From that moment on, the wealth of Mansa Musa began to grow enormously. In the medieval world, gold was considered the most valuable source of wealth on the entire planet. Many historians believe that Mansa Musa owned almost half of all available reserves of gold in the world at that time. They arranged thousands of trading centers for gold and other valuable goods like salt in Mali. And part of all this large-scale trade profit went directly into the pocket of Mansa Musa. He had everything, money, power, and servants. But there was something he desperately lacked. His desire was similar to his brother's. Mansa Musa also wanted to travel, not to discover the world, but to glorify his empire. He wanted fame. Only a few people heard of his powerful kingdom abroad, 
but he knew that his country was almost the richest in the whole world. To achieve what he wanted, Mansa Musa went on a pilgrimage to Mecca through the Sahara Desert and Egypt. This trip was one of the greatest anyone had ever undertaken. Mansa Musa set on his journey with a caravan consisting of about 60,000 people. He was accompanied by the entire royal court, all the officials, thousands of soldiers, artists, camel drivers, merchants, and tens of thousands of servants. They took a long flock of goats and sheep for food. It was a huge city wandering through the desert. Just imagine the amount of water and food needed to feed this crowd. As soon as the king announced a halt, long tent camps were set up. It would take you a whole day to walk around this territory. Thousands of people worked on cooking food. Artists were playing on stage. Merchants were offering their goods to people inside the camp or to travelers passing by. Servants took care of the animals and helped with household issues. All this was happening under the scorching sun on the hot sand. And then they had to fold the tent city back to get on the road again. Most likely, not everyone managed to survive such a journey. But the good news was that Mansa Musa treated his people very well. Almost all of these people were dressed in the best Persian silk and fabrics woven from gold threads. Hundreds of camels were pulling loads with hundreds of thousands of pounds of pure gold. There was so much gold that you could see it shining in the sun from afar. No one was ever hungry or thirsty. There were enough supplies for a comfortable trip. The travelers passing by were amazed by the scale and beauty of the huge royal expedition. Rumors of the approaching king of Mali reached Cairo before the king himself. Finally, Mansa Musa's caravan arrived in Cairo. The locals were shocked by all that luxury and wealth. But the coolest thing was that the ruler generously shared it with people. The gold he gave them made many poor people rich. He stayed in Cairo for three months. Gold was everywhere. And that's why it lost its value. It made no sense to sell goods for gold when everyone had it. That's how Mansa Musa lowered the price of gold and destroyed the country's economy during his stay in Cairo. According to estimates of modern economists and historians, the crisis he caused led to losses of about $1.5 billion in the Middle East. When he realized what he had done, he tried to help the economy. One theory says that he wasn't able to do it because he had spent all the money. According to another story, he wanted to take some of the gold back from circulation. To do this, he attempted to borrow gold at huge interest rates from Egyptian lenders. He failed to restore the economy, but reached his desirable goal. News and rumors about his wealth and generosity spread all over the world. An image of an African king sitting on a golden throne with a piece of gold in his hand appeared on the map of the Catalan Atlas of 1375. With this drawing, they designated Timbuktu, the major city of Mali, and the king sitting there was Mansa Musa. Here's some real stories mixed with legends about the city and its ruler. Some said it was impossible to count the amount of wealth that Mansa Musa owned. Others believed that he had enough gold to make every person on the planet rich. People from all over the world began to travel to Mali to see this place with their own eyes. Timbuktu had become an African El Dorado thanks to the mystery and legends. Many thought it was a golden city at the end of the world. European treasure hunters and explorers went on long, dangerous journeys to visit the kingdom. But all this happened many years after the reign of Mansa Musa. He not only glorified his country and his name all over the world, but also returned to his homeland with new scientists, poets, and architects. He paid them hundreds of pounds of gold to convince them to move to Timbuktu. The amount he gave to each of them would be around $8 million in today's money. He started investing in education, arts, literature, architecture, and libraries. He built schools and colleges. During the reign of Mansa Musa, Timbuktu became a center of education. People from all over the world came here to get high-quality knowledge. In 1337, Mansa Musa passed away at the age of 56. His sons inherited all his wealth, but they failed to keep their father's legacy. Many disputes, attempts to get more money, uprisings, and intrigues all led to the collapse of the powerful kingdom. Small states divided. For hundreds of years, Mali had been losing its power. Then, Europeans came to this territory, and it finally destroyed the empire. That's why so little is known about the royal dynasty of Mansa Musa today. 
the history of the Middle Ages is mainly viewed from the West. And in the West, just a few people heard of Mali during the reign of Mansa Musa. If Europeans had visited the kingdom more in its prime, at the peak of military and economic power, Mansa Musa would have become much more famous, and the kingdom's glory would have stretched for many centuries. But the Europeans were about 200 years too late. They found the country during a severe crisis and uprisings. It's still impossible to calculate how rich he was. Perhaps nobody else will ever be able to reach this level. If the Mansa Musa dynasty lived up to today and kept the empire, we'd probably live in a completely different world. Africa could be the richest and most developed continent in the world, and Mali would be its center. The kingdom would achieve all this peacefully. Mansa Musa was generous and preferred to conquer countries with luxury, not force. Once every couple of months you have bouts of hiccuping that last 10 to 20 minutes and you think that it's horrible? Oh my sweet summer child, imagine hiccuping for 68 years straight. How would you like this? A man named Charles Osborne had quite a funny way of talking that he developed to hide the sound of his endless hiccups. Poor guy had been hiccuping non-stop starting from June 13, 1922 for over 68 years. So here's the story. Osborne was born back in 1893, and he started hiccuping after a small accident on a farm in Nebraska. He fell over, but he didn't feel anything weird until he started hiccuping like crazy. Doctors think that the accident might have damaged a small part of his brain that helped stop the hiccup reflex. There are a few different theories about what might have caused his hiccups. Some people think that he might have hurt his ribs during the fall, and that messed with his diaphragm muscle. Others think that he hit his head and had a stroke. Either way, he was stuck with the hiccups for all his remaining life. Can you imagine having 20 to 40 involuntary diaphragm spasms per minute for that long? By the time Osborne finally stopped hiccuping, he had probably done it about 430 million times in total during all his 97 year long life. It was so bad that he saw a number of doctors, sometimes traveling quite far, but nobody could fix it. One doctor even tried to help him by putting him on a mix of carbon monoxide and oxygen, and it helped for a bit, but that ended up being a bad idea, since breathing in the poison gas wasn't a safe solution. Instead, Osborne had to learn a special breathing technique to minimize the hick sound that came with each spasm. He'd breathe in between hiccups and flex his chest a few times per minute to suppress the noise. It was still obvious that he was hiccuping since he'd heave and jerk, but at least it wasn't as loud. Osborne had been hiccuping for 56 years when he became famous by giving an interview in 1978. He said that he'd do anything to get rid of the hiccups, and that he didn't even know what it would be like to not have them. He was constantly sore from all the jerking and spasming. After speaking up, he got a lot of attention in the media. He was even listed in the Guinness World Records and appeared on TV shows like The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, and that's incredible. People from all over the country sent him letters with suggestions for how to cure the hiccups, but none of them worked for more than a little while. But this ordeal didn't stop Charles Osborne from living a relatively normal life. People knew him as a happy-go-lucky guy who loved cracking jokes and didn't talk much about his condition. He married twice and had eight children. He sold farm machinery and auctioned off livestock for living. In 1990, for reasons that are still a mystery, Osborne's hiccup suddenly stopped after over six decades. Unfortunately, he passed away just a year later. I bet, however, that his last months were really happy because they were finally hiccup-free. Despite all the medical advancements made since Osborne's time, there is still no surefire way to cure prolonged hiccuping. Hiccups are a strange phenomenon that have been around since the dawn of mammalian existence. We still don't fully understand why they happen or what purpose they serve. Researchers are slowly uncovering the answers to two key questions. Why do hiccups occur in the first place? And how can we stop them? Hiccups are a reflex action, similar to the way your leg jerks when a doctor taps your knee with a hammer. This reflex is found in many mammals, from household pets like dogs and cats, to larger animals like horses and rabbits. When you hiccup, a nerve signal travels from your diaphragm, which is the muscle located at the bottom of your lungs, to your brain and back again. This process is repeated multiple times, causing your diaphragm to contract and your lungs to expand. 
However, in the middle of the inhale, a reflex causes your epiglottis, which is a flap of tissue that sits at the top of your throat, to suddenly snap shut, creating the characteristic hick sound. This is how the sudden closure of vocal cords sounds. This cycle continues until the reflex is interrupted by something like holding your breath or drinking water. Hiccuping is caused by the phrenic nerve, which is a long and oddly shaped cord that goes from the chest to the diaphragm. It first appeared in mammals' ancestors that were fish-like, but theirs was shorter and connected straight to the gills next to the brain instead of going all the way to the diaphragm. The reflex of hiccups might have been useful for amphibians that lived on land, as they needed to switch between breathing underwater with gills and breathing in the air with lungs. The epiglottis flap closed and thus sent water into their mouth and gills, keeping it from going to lungs. However, since humans no longer live underwater and do not have gills, why do hiccups still exist in us? They may have other benefits. For example, babies tend to hiccup more often than adults, especially while suckling milk. As they drink, they also swallow air, and the hiccups might be the body's way of clearing the air from the stomach. This reflex might work like a self-initiated burp. Interestingly, it's not just young infants who hiccup a lot. Even fetuses as young as 10 weeks old have been observed hiccuping. This process might serve to train fetuses' brains to map out their internal body. In other words, they need to learn where their diaphragm is located and how to control their breathing and hiccups might help them practice breathing so they're ready when they're born. Approximately 4,000 people seek medical attention for hiccups each year in the United States. How to get rid of hiccups is one of the most commonly searched health questions on Google. Most hiccups resolve by themselves within two days, but longer lasting bouts could indicate an underlying problem such as a brain tumor. Sometimes patients face continuous hiccups that don't go away even after medical treatment, known as intractable hiccups. In such cases, only treatment of the underlying condition helps. To address hiccups, doctors have tried different medications that aim to relax muscles and nerves that may cause diaphragm spasms, but there isn't enough clear evidence to recommend a specific treatment. There's a Japanese research group that has discovered a new method of curing hiccups, and it involves breathing in high concentration CO2. It tricks the brain into thinking there's a life-threatening emergency, causing it to forget about the hiccups. However, if you can't travel to Japan for this treatment, you can try some old wives' tales that have been proven to work, like drinking a whole glass of water in one gulp, standing on your head, or getting really scared. These methods work by interrupting the reflex arc, so the nerves and muscles are distracted by something else. This is a conclusion made by Ali Sifi, a neurointensivist who became obsessed with finding a cure after seeing a patient wake up with unexplainable hiccups after brain surgery. Drinking water quickly, for instance, forces the diaphragm to keep creating suction, which keeps the phrenic nerve occupied. It interrupts one part of the reflex. Similarly, getting scared, for example, activates the vagus nerve, which has a calming effect, thereby interrupting the other part of the reflex. Ali Safe has created a tool called the Hickaway which is more consistent than the traditional methods because it helps to combine both effects. It looks like a straw that requires the drinker to suck very hard, like drinking a thick milkshake, engaging both nerves and effectively ending the hiccups. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Would you like to have a super memory? What if you could remember any piece of your life in great detail? For example, you're walking down the street with a friend, and you hear a song. You remember hearing a fragment of this song 10 years ago on TV during the winter holidays in the Alps. You remember every celebration of your birthday, every party in your life. Sounds cool, but is it so good to remember your whole life? Let's find out by the example of a real person. Meet Rebecca Sherrick from Brisbane, Australia, who remembers her whole life, literally, all of it. All events are stored in her mind almost from birth, and she has immediate access to them. She remembers her parents put her in the driver's seat of a car for a photo just a few days after her birth. She remembers how the seat cover and steering wheel aroused her curiosity. Rebecca remembers how she started having her first dreams at 18 months old. She didn't distinguish dreams from reality and thought that she was really leaving home somewhere. That's why she always wanted her mom to be with her. She also remembers by heart a big book she read many years ago. 
She can easily remember how she lay in bed, looked at the surrounding toys, and how her mother approached her to feed her when she couldn't even talk and walk. She sees it so clearly as if it happened yesterday. She remembers not only visual images but also smells and even feelings and sensations that she experienced during some moments in the past. For a long time, Rebecca lived confident that everyone in the world had such a memory. Then, in adolescence, she began to suspect something was wrong with her. She noticed that she was fixated on some things from the past much more than her surroundings. It seemed to her that she had a mental disorder and she felt insecure for this reason but she had no idea how special she was. She learned about her uniqueness at age 21, when her parents showed her a news report about people with a phenomenal memory. Rebecca was surprised that it was something special. She realized she was among the 60 people worldwide with highly superior autobiographical memory, or HSM. This is a neurological condition of the brain in which a person can quickly and effortlessly reproduce in memory any fragment from life in the past. These may be some social events or personal experiences, and all of them spring up in your memory as clearly as if you're watching a high-quality video recording. Scientists are still studying the HSM phenomenon. It was discovered at the beginning of this century, and there are few objects to study, only about 60 people. The lack of information and observation slows the research process, but doctors have already learned something. This is part of the brain that helps process memory. A person with an ordinary mind remembers bright moments from life very well. In a sense, the brain of people with HSM records all the moments as bright ones. That's why people have such easy access to them. It was important for Rebecca to get an official medical diagnosis because she wanted a clear answer to the question of what was wrong with her and to improve her self-esteem. To confirm the diagnosis, Rebecca had to go through a multi-year study. She did various analyses and passed multiple tests. Then, a couple of years later, Rebecca returned and told the scientists about what had happened two years ago. When her case became famous, she revealed the dark sides of her gift, which she also calls a curse. So, HH Sam seems like a cool superpower, but there's a bad side here. Do you know that moment when you're lying in bed and suddenly remember something embarrassing that happened to you a few years ago? For example, you disgraced yourself during a presentation or couldn't find the right phrase in an argument or behaved very stupidly on a date. So people with HSAM have constant access to all these awkward moments. You can remember every last detail of every wrong moment in life. And of course, such thoughts are pretty challenging to control. Imagine how difficult it will be to fall asleep if you start remembering and reliving bad moments in life. It would be hard not to go crazy after years of such a life, and the problem is not even in the most minor visual details, but in the repeated reproduction of feelings and emotions. Someone said something hurtful to you, or you saw scary pictures on TV many years ago. All this can pop up in your memory many years later if you have H. Sam and return the same emotions to you. If Rebecca remembers a stressful case when she was three years old, then as an adult, she will experience this case as a three-year-old girl. Such emotional swings contribute to the appearance of depression, anxiety, and stress. And the more negative emotions you accumulate, the harder it will be for you to fall asleep at night. That's why Rebecca takes great care in life. She understands that any unpleasant thing can remain in her memory forever. She takes medications to control the incoming information and goes to a therapist who helps her avoid bad situations. Imagine that you need to think ahead about every step in your life. Should I watch this movie or not? Go home the other way? Read this dude's Twitter thread. This makes you too cautious and severely restricts your life because you know these moments will stay with you forever. Perhaps you would avoid risks so as not to fail. And such a life reduces the chances of success in every way. Yeah, it's cool to have H.S. Sam if you were born into a wealthy family, travel a lot, have no health, mental or social issues. Everything works out for you and you're always happy. But let's be honest, almost no one has such a life. And even the rich and successful have problems. Some people with HSAM say that their memories are well organized in the brain, like books on a bookshelf in alphabetical order. But Rebecca's memory is chaotic, her brain is filled with worries. This often causes her insomnia and headaches. Perhaps this is because she also has a confirmed diagnosis of autism. But Rebecca's life didn't turn into a nightmare. Fortunately, she learned how to overcome bad memories with positive ones. If some bad moment begins to invite into her mind, she covers it with a happy piece from her life.
and this is the most beautiful part of HSM. This feature in the brain helps you solve exams, learn something quickly, and remember all books and movies, but the coolest thing is the opportunity to experience happiness anew. Even if you're in a bad mood, you remember how much fun you had that day at the water park, and your brain enjoys this moment. This allows you to experience happiness every day, every minute. At the beginning of each month, Rebecca selects the best moments of this month in the past years. When she returns to them, it helps to fight bad memories. Another cool feature Rebecca has learned is the ability to turn any nightmare into a happy and beautiful dream. She can build and create whatever she wants during sleep, and she can remember all her dreams. Not all people with HSAM have this ability, but some also reported they had lucid dreams they could control. By the way, the only memory Rebecca doesn't have is her birthday. She doesn't know how she felt inside her mother's belly and says she wouldn't want to remember it. Today, Rebecca lives an ordinary life. She doesn't want big changes and likes to think and feel how she's used to it. She hopes that her case will help many people worldwide, so she participates in two scientific studies that can help treat certain brain diseases. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. There are very snowy winters in Sweden, you know. Snow covers all roads and slows down the traffic. Some cars may pull over to the side of the road and get out only with the help of a tractor. This is a common thing. But one day, during a snowfall, something astonishing happened. On December 19, 2011, a man named Peter Skylberg found himself in a snow trap after he drove off the main road in the north of Sweden. Then snowmobilers accidentally found him, pulled him out of there, and took him to the hospital. It may seem like something common, but here's the kicker. It took two months to find him. And outside of that time, the temperature dropped to minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. That man survived after spending 60 days without water, food, and heat sources among icy winds and endless snow. The people who found him said the car was buried deep in snow at 3 feet. And Peter Skylberg was sitting shaking inside a sleeping bag in the front seat. He couldn't speak. When they brought him to the hospital, the doctors were amazed. They knew cases when people survived in cold temperatures for a long time, but not for two months. A person can live without water for several days, but Peter had no problems with this since he extracted water from the snow. Without food, a person can survive for several weeks to three months. But what about the cold? How did Peter solve this problem? At such low temperatures, people can freeze within several hours. The doctors treating Peter claimed that his body seemed to activate survival mode and fell into a deep sleep. It's like bears that hibernate during winter. But the human body can only lower the temperature by a few degrees. This is not enough to survive in minus 22 degree frost. Maybe the man somehow managed to lower the temperature even more. The case of Peter Skylberg became famous. Doctors and scientists from all over the world put forward their hypotheses about how this man managed to survive. No one could give the exact reason. Many people claimed it was just a real miracle. Others believed it was the result of several factors combined together. One of these factors is the sleeping bag. It helps keep your body heat better so your temperature may not drop for a long time inside the bag. Another factor that probably played the key role was the igloo effect. Indigenous peoples living at the North Pole make their homes out of ice and snow. You've probably seen these round houses on the internet or in the movies. It's not warm inside them, but it doesn't let the cold in. The particular design of these houses helps keep the accumulated heat inside. Igloos can protect from strong winds, but it's possible to survive inside them only if you're wearing warm clothes. Perhaps Peter's car turned into such a house. Snow clung to it from all sides and blocked the heat inside. Many people wondered why he hadn't tried to get out and find help. But seems like Peter did the right thing. It's pretty dangerous to go out in such conditions. You don't know where you are, it's freezing cold, and there's a blizzard. Let's say you get out of the car and try to get to the nearest road. You fail and come back. But you can't find your car because the snow has covered it. Now, your situation is even worse. The only option is to start digging snow and make an igloo. If you have warm clothes, an igloo will help you to keep warm and gain some time. 
But the right solution is to stay inside the car and wait for the rescuers, especially if you don't know where you are. If you don't have communication or signal lights, then try to make a fire. Smoke can attract the attention of people passing on the nearest road. Peter Skylberg spent some time in the hospital, regained strength, and was cured. Now, it's much safer to be in a closed cold room or an igloo during the cold. However, if you're stuck in a severe frost without warm clothes, you have about 30 minutes to 2 hours, maybe even less if you don't move. But in 1980, a miracle happened that shocked people and doctors all over the U.S. 19-year-old Jean Hilliard was driving home at night to the small town of Langby. She lost control and ended up in a ditch. The girl decided to walk to her friend. She then saw her friend's house, but she didn't get there. She got too weak and fainted. Suddenly, Jean fell and lost consciousness near her friend's house. Jean Hilliard was wearing a light winter coat, cowboy boots, and pants, so she wasn't quite prepared for harsh winter conditions. There was a strong blizzard and snowfall outside, so no one noticed her. The friend Jean wanted to visit only saw the frozen girl near his porch in the morning. Jean Hilliard had been lying there for six hours. Her body was hard and cold, as if it were made of rubber. Her eyes looked as if they were made of glass. The man who noticed the girl was sure she wasn't alive. But then, he saw bubbles of moisture from her nose. The girl was breathing. He got the girl to the hospital. Her body wouldn't bend, so putting the girl in the car was problematic. The doctors immediately rushed to help Jean, but that wasn't easy. They couldn't even make any injections, as the needles would constantly break. The muscles were too stiff and frozen. Her body activated emergency mode and stopped supplying muscles and soft tissues with blood. All the red liquid was directed at the vital organs. Also, in emergency mode, our organism can slow down all internal processes of the body. The heart starts pounding slower, the lungs consume less oxygen, and the metabolism nearly stops. Such energy savings help the girl to survive. But the doctors were more surprised that Jean didn't get any serious troubles. She got frostbite, but the ice crystals didn't destroy her skin and soft tissues. Doctors decided to warm the girl with a bunch of heating pads. Then they finally managed to inject medications. A few hours later, she regained consciousness. The test showed that Jean was in perfect health. Meanwhile, you can get into a severe trap not only in nature and bad weather, You can get stuck in an elevator in a building full of people in Manhattan, and no one will know about it. This happened in 1999 with Nicholas White. The 34-year-old manager was working late in the office and decided to take a break. After getting some fresh air outside, Nicholas called the elevator to go back to the 43rd floor. But he got trapped in the elevator. It was already quite late, and almost all the workers had left the building. But the worst thing was that it was Friday night. Nicholas had no phone, no food, and no water. He pressed the emergency call button, but no one answered him. The cameras worked perfectly, but the guards didn't see him. The building was basically empty. Nicholas struggled with claustrophobia, walked from side to side, jumped, laid down, tried to open the doors, and waited for someone to rescue him. There were repair workers on the other floors, but they didn't hear Nicholas. Also, his colleagues stayed in the office where he worked. They were sure that Nicholas had just gone home. They left the office using other elevators and didn't notice that Nicholas had left his things on his desk. Well, Nicholas was in despair. He was rescued 41 hours later. He was lying on the elevator floor, tormented by thirst, when he suddenly heard a voice from the elevator speaker. Hey, is anyone there? Rescuers got the man out of the metal box and the building owners paid him compensation for the inconvenience. Despite this nightmare, Nicholas continued to use the elevators. Yeah, living in Manhattan, it would be problematic to avoid them. Certainly for Nicholas, life has its ups and downs. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Aomori Prison, Japan, 1936 Yoshi Shiratori was walking back and forth inside his prison cell, contemplating 
how he was wrongly accused of a crime he didn't commit. He didn't deserve to live the rest of his days as a prisoner. He needed to escape this filthy, cruel, and cold place where he was being mistreated every single day. But how? Amori Prison was not the easiest one to escape, so he needed to be clever and patient to be able to come up with a solid plan. Shiratori started by observing the guards' routines. He was aware that even one tiny mistake could bring an end to him, so he had to memorize their every move with great precision. After studying their schedules for months, he realized that there was a 15-minute gap in their patrol time from 5.30 a.m. to 5.45 a.m. This was it. He had found his escape window. But then there was the problem of how he was going to pick his cell's lock. Shiratori was not the one to give up in the face of one minor inconvenience. Prisoners were provided with bathing buckets when they were inside the bathhouse. To his surprise, Shiratori realized that these were wrapped with a metal support ring which he could use as a wire. So, one day, he smuggled one back into his cell and waited for his moment to freedom. When the clock struck 5.30 a.m. and the coast was finally clear, Shiratori made his move. His hands were shaking due to the cold as he tried to pick the lock, and the fear of getting caught did not help either. It took him a few minutes, but he was finally able to kick his cell door open and run to his freedom. At 5.45 a.m., guards returned and checked his cell. To them, everything looked normal. Shiratori was sound asleep in his bed. But of course, what they didn't realize was the fact that it was not actually him who was under the blanket. Before he left, Shiratori had placed pieces of floorboard onto his futon to trick the guards to buy himself more time. So, nobody suspected anything until the next morning. But by then, Shiratori was long gone. However, this was only the beginning of Shiratori's story, who would later be known as the legendary prison break magician. Three days after his first escape, Shiratori got caught again while trying to steal supplies from a hospital. And just like that, he was back in prison. This time, he was sentenced to life for his escape attempt. He had no hopes to see his wife and daughter ever again. All those months of planning were for nothing. And on top of everything, in 1942, he got transferred to Akita prison, where the conditions were even harsher than before. The guards who had heard about his escape attempt were determined to make an example out of him. In addition to all the extreme manual labor he had to do, he was forced to sleep on the hard concrete floor during the severe winter cold. And when he wasn't working, he was placed into solitary confinement for extended periods of time to make sure he could never attempt anything funny. You see, this isolation cell was specially designed to keep escape artists from escaping. It was very small had a very high ceiling and smooth copper walls that would make it impossible to climb. In addition, there was no sunlight whatsoever. The only window in the cell was the small one located in the ceiling. And on top of everything, Shiratori was handcuffed and mistreated by the guards at all times. However, one of them, Kobayashi, took pity on him and was concerned for his well-being. That's why he checked up on him from time to time, which made his miserable life a bit more bearable inside this awful place. On the stormy night of June 15th, at around midnight, the guards peered into the solitary cell and couldn't believe their eyes. Shiratori was nowhere to be found, and all that was left were his handcuffs. But how did he do it? First of all, Shiratori knew all the tricks to get out of cuffs, so they simply didn't work on him. Once his hands were free, by pressing his palms and soles of his feet on the smooth copper walls, he climbed the unclimbable wall with ease. The ceiling window was sealed, 
But Shiratori noticed that the wooden framing around it started to rot. So, night after night, he climbed there when the guards weren't looking and loosened the framing bit by bit. He finally succeeded in breaking the rusted fittings. However, he waited until one stormy night so that when he was out, no one would be able to hear his footsteps on the roof. Three months later, Shiratori knocked on the door of the person whom he thought to be his friend, Kobayashi. He wanted him to stand by his side as he fought against the corrupt prison system. Since he was the only guard who respected him, Shiratori felt like he could trust him to do the right thing. But this was a big mistake. When Shiratori went to the bathroom, Kobayashi wasted no time informing the authorities that he was there. So, Shiratori was arrested and sent back to prison for a third time. Since he became something of a legend at this point, the authorities wanted to make sure he could not escape for a third time. So, they sent him to the most notorious and high-security Abashiri prison. It was in the northern part of the country and got plenty of snow, so no prisoner dared escape it with their thin uniforms. At first, he was thrown into an open cell exposed to the extreme cold while still wearing his summer prison uniform, and the guards were awful to him. One time, he got so angry that he broke his handcuffs in front of them, but that just made things even worse. He got locked in a cell wearing heavy iron restraints fitted around his ankles and wrists, which required two hours to unlock by a blacksmith. Shiratori vowed to escape, but this time, it all seemed impossible. Yet again, he found a way. Every day when the guards delivered prisoners their meals, Shiratori would drip his miso soup on his iron shackles as well as the food slot on his cell door. This ever so slowly wore down the metal, and finally, he was able to slip out of the chains. The hole, however, was still too small to fit a person, so Shiratori dislocated his own shoulder to slip through the hatch. He was a free man once more as well as the first man to ever escape Abashiri prison. He went into hiding for over a year but was caught again after he had a fight with a farmer for stealing a tomato from his farm. Authorities were not going to leave anything to chance now and they locked him up at the Sapporo prison. The only opening in his cell was smaller than his head, and there were guards standing in front of it 24 hours a day. So, you can imagine the shock they felt when they couldn't find Shiratori there one day. This time, Shiratori managed to escape by digging a tunnel right under his bed using a miso soup bowl. He was a free man for a year, until one day, an officer sat next to him on a park bench. He didn't realize his true identity, but Shiratori was so moved by his kind attitude that he decided to reveal himself. He was arrested once again, but this time, having reviewed his case, the court revoked the harsh conditions of his sentence and sent him to the more comfortable Fuchu prison in Tokyo, where he was released even earlier for good behavior. He was finally able to reunite with his daughter as a truly free man. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hey, want to hear something shocking? In an ordinary house outlet that we use to charge the phone, the voltage is 110 volts. A high-voltage power line that provides electricity to dozens of buildings has a voltage of 100,000 volts. The energy of one lightning strike is more than 10 million volts. Woo! And the temperature of lightning is almost twice the temperature on the sun's surface. And this incredible charge is flying at a speed of just two and a half times slower than the speed of light. Now imagine what happens to a person when lightning strikes them. Well, let me tell you, the discharge passes through the body in one hundredth of a second. Lightning can stop our hearts and disrupt the work of our entire nervous system. You may not even realize what has happened at first. Perhaps you will lose consciousness and your body will be in a state of shock. 
Every day, there are several million lightning strikes in the world. Fortunately, you have little chance of getting hit by one. The odds that lightning will strike you is about 15,300 to 1. About 20,000 people are struck by lightning every year. The chances that lightning will strike you twice are even smaller. And what are the odds that you'll be struck by lightning seven times throughout your life? It seems impossible, but one person experienced it for himself. His name was Roy Sullivan. He was born in 1912 in Greene County, Virginia, in a big family with seven children. Roy was an ordinary guy and was no different from his brothers and sisters. But for some reason, the natural element chose him. In 1936, he began working as a ranger at Shenandoah National Park. There, lightning struck him seven times over 35 years. So, the first accident happened in April 1942. On that day, a strong thunderstorm began. Roy took refuge in a new fire tower where builders hadn't installed a lightning rod. Lightning struck the building several times. A massive fire started inside and Roy ran out. As soon as he was a few feet away from the shelter, lightning hit his toe and burned a hole in his shoe. The next time occurred 27 years later, in July 1969. Roy was working in the National Park. He was driving a truck through hilly terrain when a storm started. Lightning struck him through the open car window. The charge burned his eyebrows and eyelashes and slightly touched his hair. Roy lost consciousness and the car continued to move. It stopped at the very edge of a cliff. Fifteen minutes later, Roy came to his senses. A year later, in July 1970, the third time occurred. The weather was fine, but in a matter of minutes, clouds became thicker and a thunderstorm began. Lightning struck a transformer near Roy. The man ran away as fast as possible, but nature got him again. Lightning hit his shoulder. Two years later, in 1972, lightning struck Roy for the fourth time while he was working at the National Park Station. The charge set his hair on fire, and the man ran to the bathroom and used a wet towel to put out the flames on his burning head. From that moment, Roy began to suspect that some invisible evil force had been pursuing him. He started to carry a bottle of water with him to put out the fire in case of another hit. The fifth strike happened in the National Park again. It occurred in 1973. Roy tripped over a rock and fell. At that moment, he noticed thunderclouds in the sky. Frightened, he ran to his truck, got inside, and stepped on the gas. Roy drove as far from that spot as possible. Then he stopped and got out of the car to see where the storm was. And at that moment, lightning struck again. It went through his left arm and left leg, and set his shoe on fire. Roy quickly climbed back into the truck and extinguished the fire using his water bottle. In 1976, the sixth case occurred. Roy was walking along a trail in the park, just one mile away from the place where lightning struck him the last time. And then storm clouds appeared again. Lightning flashed and stung Roy in the palm. After the sixth strike, he began to suspect something was wrong with the park. After 40 years of working, Roy finally decided to quit. Finally. He hoped the lightning would stop chasing him. But he was wrong. By that time, the man had already become a celebrity. But such fame didn't let him enjoy life. People were afraid to be near him because they believed the lightning could hit them at any moment. Journalists gave Roy Sullivan the nicknames Spark Ranger and Human Lightning Conductor. Of course, the man disliked all of this and felt very lonely. But besides this problem, he also suffered from constant fears and the feeling of persecution. All the time, he was waiting for the lightning to strike again at any moment. Fortunately, he was married. His wife supported him and helped him in everything. After quitting his job, Roy decided to move with his wife to the small town of Dooms, Virginia. Wow, dooms. Talk about foreshadowing. It was only a year without accidents. Then, on June 25, 1977, lightning struck Roy again. He went fishing at the local pond early in the morning. 
The catch was good, but the sky was overcast. Roy immediately felt there would be a strike. There was a smell of sulfur in the air, and the hairs on his arms stood on end. His whole body tensed. Lightning struck Roy in the head, passing through his chest and stomach. The man ran to his car to take cover. At that moment, a hungry bear came out of the forest. He approached Roy's bucket of fish to pick up all the trout the man had caught. Roy ran out of the vehicle with his hair on his head smoldering to chase the animal away. After the seventh lightning strike, he lost hearing in his left ear and realized he couldn't hide from the lightning anywhere. His wife was afraid to be with him outside during a thunderstorm. One day, she was hanging laundry in the backyard. Roy came out of the house to help her. A few minutes later, lightning struck his wife. Fortunately, she wasn't badly injured. After that, besides fear and social loneliness, he felt guilt. Of course, many doctors and scientists tried to help Roy. But no one managed to find the reason for this strange phenomenon. According to science, each time it was just a coincidence. Mathematics and physics were powerless here. With such answers from scientists, Roy believed that invisible forces were pursuing him or that fate was punishing him for something. Perhaps the answer lies in the man's past. The National Park Service and doctors documented all seven times when he was struck by lightning. But there was another eighth time, which couldn't be confirmed. According to Roy, Lightning struck him in his youth when he was helping his father mow wheat. The discharge hit the scythe blade. No one but the boy saw it. Perhaps at that moment, the lightning changed something in his body and made him more attractive for the next hits. Lightning always chooses the path of least resistance. And this is how lightning occurs. Rain, ice, and snow particles collide with one another inside a storm. This process increases the imbalance between clouds and the ground, negatively charging the lower layers of clouds. Things down there, like trees and the Earth, get positively charged and create another imbalance. Nature tries to remedy this imbalance between the two opposite charges by passing an electric current through them. Perhaps nature felt some charge imbalance in Roy's body and tried to remedy it. But why did he get struck at an interval of one to two years? Besides, more than 20 years passed between the first and second hit. Scientists still can't explain what happened to him. Maybe Roy was just an attractive guy. As you can probably predict, Roy Sullivan was listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the person struck by lightning most often in the world. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. We're in England, in the village of Turville. It's 1871. Here, on one street, you can find a particular house. It's no different from the others, but many stay around it and wait for something. The house's doors open. Several adults come out of there. They look surprised and say that all the rumors turned out to be true. The woman goes out on the porch and asks a few more people to come in, and you're among them. You go inside, head into the room, and see an 11-year-old girl sleeping on the bed. She looks pale and thin. Despite loud people's conversations in the room, the girl doesn't wake up. Her mother says it's been six months since she fell asleep. You leave the room and the next few people come in to see the sleeping girl with their own eyes. This is a story about the most prolonged sleep in history. The record belongs to a girl named Ellen Sadler, who slept for nine years. She was born in the English village of Turville in the second half of the 19th century in a big family. Ellen was the 12th kid. Her parents weren't wealthy and worked hard to make ends meet. They taught their sons and daughters to help them from an early age, and Ellen was no exception. When she turned 11, she left home to work as a nanny in a nearby town. While away from her family and surrounded by strangers, Ellen began to feel bad. She had a headache, felt discomfort, and felt certain drowsiness. These symptoms became so severe that the girl couldn't work properly. She returned to the house in the village where her parents sent her to the hospital. 
The doctors didn't know how to help her because they couldn't diagnose her. They spent 18 weeks trying to cure the poor girl. As a result, still unwell, Ellen was discharged from the hospital. After returning home, she experienced severe headaches and drowsiness. Ellen Sadler felt worse and worse. And then, one day, she quietly lay down in her bed and fell asleep. Ellen woke up only after nine years. All this time, the girl's mother took care of her. She fed her milk and tea. The sleeping girl was losing weight and strength. Soon, the whole village found out about Ellen. People started coming to her house to see an unusual phenomenon. They looked at her, tried to wake her up, and told their friends about her. The news about the sleeping girl spread throughout the country. Ellen had become a spectacle. People from all over England came to see a person who had been sleeping for several years. They called the house where Ellen's family lived Sleepy Cottage. Doctors and reporters came there. One journalist from the Daily Telegraph described that the girl's body was weak and too soft. Her feet were icy cold and her lips were blue. The child's breathing was barely discernible. It seemed that life was slowly leaving this body. The girl's family took donations for the care of their daughter. Therefore, many people thought it was all a performance. For some reason, the mother didn't allow the doctor to stay with Ellen for a long time. Some said that her mother gave her sleeping pills every day to not let her wake up. And someone claimed that they had seen a conscious girl sitting by the window. Also, the girl's mother rejected the doctor's offer to conduct a medical examination in a London hospital. We're unlikely to find out the whole truth about her since there was no official diagnosis from doctors. It's possible the girl fell into a coma or suffered from another disease that was unknown to science in the 19th century. It could be a chronic sleep disorder in which a person experiences uncontrollable bouts of drowsiness. You can walk down the street and want to sleep so much that you fall to the ground. Ellen grew up in a large family and got used to hard work early. Perhaps severe fatigue and lack of sleep provoked narcolepsy. In any case, this story had a good ending. One day, Ellen Sadler woke up. She didn't remember what had happened and was very surprised when her family told her about the nine-year-long dream. The girl's growth slowed down a little and her eyesight worsened, but her health wasn't bad. Ellen got married and had six children. In 1911, at the age of about 50, she passed away. Let's see a completely opposite story about a person who set a record for the longest time without sleep. In January 1964, 17-year-old Randy Gardner, a high school student, claimed he stayed awake for several weeks. The experiment started in December and ended in January. At the end of that time, he felt pretty normal. This event was in the Guinness Book of Records and allowed scientists to learn a lot about the structure of the human brain. Randy wanted to do a science school project related to sleep. He had to stay awake as long as possible, and his friend had to make sure that he was always awake. In the beginning, everything went well. Randy's friend kept a diary where he recorded the slightest changes in the subject's body. Randy held on easily for the first two days. He was constantly on his feet and didn't come to bed. After three days, his cognitive and sensory abilities began to decline. On the fourth day, Randy felt sick. He walked around the house and sniffed citrus fruits. The smell of lemons and oranges helped him get rid of this bad condition. During the day, Randy played basketball and went bowling with friends. The nights were boring because the guys didn't know what to do. But still, Randy didn't go to bed. A week passed and Randy showed excellent basketball results. His physical skills hadn't changed. His speech was clear and logical. By this moment, the news all over the country had been speaking about Randy and his experiment. He became a celebrity, and it also helped him stay awake. Scientists came to Randy. With the help of mathematical questions, they tested his intellectual abilities. And here, he showed poor results. He was solving an example in mathematics, but then he forgot what was going on and what he was doing. Scientists scanned his brain and recorded its activity data. Then, on January 8, 1964, at 2 a.m., 
Randy broke the previous record time without sleep. He was awake for 264 hours. Scientists attached electrodes to his head when he fell asleep and observed brain activity. Randy woke up after a few hours of sleep to go to the toilet. Then he lay in bed and got up only after 14 hours. He went to school in a great mood. Everyone was shocked. It seemed that his brain-heavy experiment had no negative consequences. Randy continued to study as before, play basketball, and spend time with friends. Scientists studied brain research results and found that Randy's brain was catching a light sleep all this time. These are called microsleeps, and the curious thing is that the person who's experiencing it may not even notice that they're technically sleeping. Several years passed. Everyone already forgot about this record. Randy grew up. One day, a reporter remembered Randy's experiment and interviewed him. He admitted that the experiment hadn't passed without a trace. For many years, Randy experienced severe insomnia. It was driving him crazy. He spent a lot of time and effort to overcome this disease. Fortunately, he managed to adjust his sleep regime. Randy slept six hours a day, which was quite enough. Repeating this experiment is a bad idea. Even two days without sleep are a great stress for the body. For thousands of years, people have survived hunger and complex work conditions. Our heart is trained to experience high loads, and our body can survive difficult situations. But our body has never encountered a lack of sleep in the entire history of humanity. Evolution has not taught us to endure sleepless nights without consequences, which is why it's bad for our health. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Not many survival stories can rival the miracle that happened to Marine Lieutenant Colonel William Henry Rankin in 1959. See for yourself. One bad day. This man nearly drowned. Falling from the sky. Um, are you saying that it sounds too paradoxical to be true? Then take a seat. I'll tell you a story. It was July 26, 1959, when Rankin was piloting his F-8 Crusader, a single-engine supersonic aircraft, along the North Carolina coast. It was a high-altitude flight, and Rankin, together with his wingman, Navy Lieutenant Herbert Nolan, were flying at the height of more than 47,000 feet. Their jets, nicknamed Candy Stripers because of their unusual orange and silver-gray coloring, were moving through the air smoothly and lightning fast. The only thing that could cause some trouble was a storm that was raging far beneath the planes. But now, it didn't present any threat. However, the pilots were supposed to pass through this storm on their way to the Marine Air Base in Beaufort, South Carolina. Things took a turn for the worse when the aircraft was approximately nine miles and mere minutes away from the military base. Suddenly, Rankin's engine quit, and the fire warning light switched on. Unable to restart the engine that had lost all power, the man knew he didn't have many options. That's why, desperately trying to keep his plane from gaining speed and going into a complete nosedive, Rankin radioed his partner. Engine failure? I have to eject. It was a terrifying decision since the altitude was too extreme, and the Marine didn't have a pressure suit. The only thing that could help him survive was an oxygen mask with a limited oxygen supply. In any case, the pilot didn't have a choice. Without hesitation, he pulled the overhead handle that triggered the ejection, and in no time, he was in the air, and his plane disappeared in the clouds below. Now Rankin was in a free fall at a height of 40,000 feet, with a temperature of minus 65 degrees F. Usually, sports skydivers make their jumps from a height of 3,500 to 10,000 feet. Only highly experienced experts jump from altitudes higher than 15,000 feet. Even then, it can lead to serious complications if they don't have all the necessary equipment, including a pressure suit, which, as you remember, Rankin didn't have. That means that when the man found himself in the air at such an unprecedented height, he experienced severe decompression. It felt as if his stomach had increased to twice its size, and his nose seemed like it was about to explode. His eyes, ears, and mouth started to bleed. For several blood-curdling moments, the Marine was sure that the decompression would finish him right away. Little did he know, he had a much more severe trial ahead. Rankin continued falling, and all he could feel besides all-encompassing fear was the shocking cold. 
His wrists and ankles were burning as if someone had put ice directly on his skin. He'd lost one of his gloves while leaving the plane, and his left hand felt completely numb. And to make matters even worse, he was still in freefall. Of course, the pilot had a parachute, but it was supposed to deploy automatically at an altitude of 10,000 feet. And even if Rankin had decided to open it, he simply wouldn't have been able to do this. That's why, in a matter of seconds and at a dizzying speed, the man hit the very storm he'd been piloting his plane over just minutes before. And that's when another calamity happened. Rankin had been falling through the black clouds with almost no visibility for about five minutes, surrounded by lightning, rain, hail, and violent winds, when something went wrong with the barometer that was supposed to deploy his parachute automatically. Fooled by the violent weather raging around the Marine, it triggered prematurely, and the man got stuck in the very middle of a thunderstorm. But it wasn't just any old thunderstorm. Nope. The unlucky 39-year-old fighter pilot plunged straight into a cumulonimbus cloud. These clouds, which often look like huge puffy mushrooms, are incredibly dense and tend to appear in areas where the atmosphere is extremely unstable. Also, such clouds are vertical, and the peaks of the most monstrous ones can reach the height of 70,000 feet. The taller the cumulonimbus cloud is, the more unstable and violent it is inside. That was the circumstance Rankin ended up in after his parachute opened too early. Conversely, even if his parachute had deployed at the supposed altitude of 10,000 feet, the man would still have been sucked back up into the cloud with the updraft. In any case, the pilot didn't have time to dwell on this. His body was tossed about as if he was nothing more than a rag doll. He would hit the fabric of his parachute, fall back down and repeat this cycle again. The tossing was so bad that even the experienced fighter pilot felt seasick. Lightning snapped and crackled around Rankin, and even though he didn't hear the thunder per se, he could feel it vibrating through his body. The hailstones were so big that at some moments Rankin worried they would tear his parachute. The worst happened when the pilot was falling through the rain. For several terrifying moments, the man was sure that he would drown. He was trying to take a breath, but only breathed in mouthfuls of water. If he'd stayed in that region of the storm for any longer, drowning while falling through the air would have become a frighteningly real outcome. He tried to hold his breath, but it was a very dangerous thing to do while falling at breakneck speed. Meanwhile, Rankin was also blown up and down, sometimes as much as 5,000 feet at a time. It seemed to him like he'd been falling for ages, with blasts of compressed air hitting him the whole time. Fortunately, not only good things, but bad ones too, tend to come to an end. When Rankin finally reached the bottom of the Cumulonimbus Tower, he'd been inside for more than 40 agonizing minutes. The pilot was shocked to discover that he was relatively unscathed. The lightning hadn't grazed him, his parachute was in one piece, and he hadn't drowned in the rainwater. The only thing he had to worry about now was a safe landing. At first, Rankin was going down toward a clearing, but his bad luck continued, because at the last moment, a powerful gust of wind threw him into a tree. The parachute got tangled in the branches, and the pilot hit his head on the trunk. Luckily, he was still wearing his helmet and didn't lose consciousness. After freeing himself and staggering to his feet, the pilot limped through the forest until he found a country road, but hitching a ride turned out to be a tough task. Imagine a man standing on the side of the road, covered in blood and dressed in a soaked, ripped-up flight suit. No wonder there weren't many volunteers to give him a lift. But eventually, someone picked him up and drove to a payphone where Rankin managed to call for an ambulance. There, he found out what a lucky man he really was. He had countless bruises and welts scattered all over his body. He suffered from bad decompression effects, and he had frostbite. But other than that, the ordeal didn't leave any long-term damage. Rankin spent several weeks in the hospital and made a complete recovery. Later, he wrote the book, The Man Who Rode the Thunder, where he described his experience. If you know other incredible survival stories, let me know down in the comments. If you learned something new today, then give this video a like and share it with a friend. But hey, don't go bail out on me just yet. We have over 2,000 cool videos for you to check out. All you have to do is pick the left or right video, click on it, and enjoy. Stay on the bright side of life. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. There are lots of famous mysteries that you can explain now if you carefully study the details.
The tragedy of the Titanic, for example. Anyone can recreate a picture of that night and build a map of those terrible events with all the information available online now. You can also explain what's going on in the Bermuda Triangle. Spoiler alert, nothing mysterious about it. Missing trains, time-traveling planes, strange black holes in the desert, spooky sounds, visual anomalies. You may not find the answers to all these riddles right away, but if you apply some critical thinking and a whole lot of dedication, you can eventually gain a better, more practical understanding of what exactly is going on. So, I'm now gonna tell you about the disappearance of Martha Wright. But this story is not like all the others I just mentioned. This mysterious and creepy puzzle is almost impossible to solve. There are no leads, no clues, no theories that make any sense of it. This is one of those cases that can really make you feel clueless, pun intended. But regardless, I'll still try my best to explain it to you. So, let's look at this story from the very beginning and try not to miss even the tiniest details. The year is 1975. Jackson Wright and his wife Martha Wright are going by car from New Jersey to New York. It's a little hot inside the cabin, so Jackson turns on his AC. The road they're on leads them into the Lincoln Tunnel. They're driving in there, slowing down a bit. After a few minutes, Jackson starts to wipe the windshield, holding his hand on the wheel. Some condensation has accumulated on the glass because of the unstable conditioner. The rear window is also slightly fogged up, so Jackson slows down and then stops the car. There are no other vehicles in the tunnel. Jackson takes two rags out of the glove compartment. He gives one of them to Martha and asks her to wipe the rear window. His wife is moving into the back seat to remove the condensation. She doesn't leave the car. Jackson wipes the front window for a few seconds, turns to Martha and can't find her. She's vanished. All the doors are closed. There is only one car in the tunnel. Jackson's. At first, he thinks it's some kind of a joke. He looks carefully at the back seats and out the windows. Martha, where are you? He asks in fear in his voice. He opens the door with his hands trembling. Martha, Jackson screams. His voice echoes through the entire dark tunnel. Martha Wright has just literally vanished into thin air. It's a bit creepy, isn't it? Poor Martha and poor Jackson. At first glance, some might say that the real reason for Martha's disappearance is her husband, and that he made the whole story up as an excuse. We don't know what kind of relationship they were in. Maybe they had a fight or planned a divorce. Yes, it would be easy to blame the husband, but you don't have enough evidence to support that conclusion. Immediately after the disappearance, Jackson contacted the police. An investigation began. Detectives interviewed people passing by the tunnel that day. They carefully studied all the streets, alleys, and even the nearest basements. Of course, they didn't ignore the possibility that Jackson was guilty, but they couldn't find any evidence to that effect either. It almost seemed like Martha didn't exist at all. Jackson loved his wife. He couldn't get over the fact that no one could explain her disappearance. The police certainly couldn't find her. Jackson drove through that tunnel many times, hoping that one day, in the light of his headlights, the silhouette of his missing wife would appear. Are you getting nervous? Well, you need to beat that fear if you want to figure things out. You need to assess the situation with a clear mind. Okay, so. It was 1975. There were no phones or cameras. There was one car in a dark tunnel. I'm sure there are some rooms and long corridors that connect the Lincoln Tunnel to the sewer system or the subway. So I'm thinking, what if someone took Martha Wright out of her car? What if it was mole people? You've probably heard of them. People that live in the underground labyrinths of the New York subway. There are a lot of rumors about them. 
The story goes that, for some reason, they refused to live like ordinary citizens of the city and descended into its dungeons. They have no contact with sunlight at all. They can see in the dark. Their diet consists of rats and trash. They can quickly crawl on all fours and even climb walls. Their sense of smell is developed, and they can sense an uninvited guest from afar. Sometimes they get out of their tunnels at night to gather provisions or food. What if, on that terrible day in 1975, the mole people crept up to the car unnoticed, quietly opened the door, grabbed Martha, and dragged her into the kingdom of darkness? Jackson might not have noticed it. Sounds compelling, right? Well, fortunately, all these stories about mole people are fictional. There are people who live in the underground tunnel systems of major cities, but they don't look like moles, and they eat normal food. In other words, they're just people trying to survive. There are many articles on the internet describing their real life. They come down to live in the tunnels for various reasons. The most common story is that, for one reason or another, they couldn't make it in the city. For example, one guy lost his job and had a fight with his wife and got injured, so everyone abandoned him and his only option was to migrate down below. There was one story of one woman who tried to hide from some bad people on those underground labyrinths. Hundreds and even thousands of people live in environments like these, each for their own reasons. And believe me, their way of life is not as terrible as it may seem. Many people in these tunnels have electrical appliances, internet access, water, and heating. Inside many of these communities, it is forbidden to steal, harm anybody, or behave rudely or obscenely. People here try to help each other. During the day, they can earn money by washing cars, or handing out bottles, or at the laundry. At night, they return back to the tunnels. Lots of these people just couldn't integrate into society. Some people are happier there because they don't have to pay taxes and rent. They don't have to follow the rules and pretend to be someone they aren't. Many of them are polite, smart, and well-educated. Often they are friends with many street artists and filmmakers. It's a unique lifestyle, all on its own, with its own communities. Occasionally, some of them would manage to get out of those tunnels, but then return, feeling that they really belong to the tunnel system and couldn't quite integrate with the world up above. It was in 1904 when the first line of the New York subway opened that stories about these mole people began to spread. Since then, these stories have been overrun with legends and myths. The city's residents thought that the tunnel's inhabitants had created secret societies with their own system of rules and laws, infrastructure, and the division between poor and rich. Few people ventured down there to check. But in the late 90s, more and more journalists began to conduct investigations about these mole people. Eventually, the myth was debunked. But who knows? Maybe in the 1970s, there were many dangerous people among the tunnel inhabitants. Honestly, I can't believe that they managed to pull Martha out of the car and into the tunnels without Jackson noticing. For one thing, she would have screamed or tried to kick loose. Plus, all the car doors were closed. So, as far as theories go, this ain't it. Okay, then let's keep looking. We have the car, the AC, the tunnel sunny weather. All right, let's look at the tunnel again. It seems to me that something is wrong with it. Something in the story doesn't quite add up. If we look at the maps and traffic data, we will see that many drivers use the Lincoln Tunnel daily. I'm sure it was just as popular in the 1970s. So how is it possible that Jackson and his wife were the only visitors to this tunnel in the middle of the day? They were driving in it for a few minutes, then stopped to wipe the windows. And not a single car passed by during that time. The tunnel wasn't closed or under repair. Jackson wouldn't have been able to get there if that went the truth. People walk through this tunnel in any weather. They hide here from the rain and heat and use the tunnels like a little shortcut. 
You can meet anyone there, at night, early in the morning, and in the afternoon. Why didn't Jackson see anyone? All right, we're getting nowhere with this. Let's look at this story from a different angle. Where were Jackson and Martha coming from? Where exactly were they going? To visit friends? Maybe their relatives? And who exactly were they? That's something we ought to know, right? And luckily for us, that's exactly where the most interesting part of the story actually is. As it turns out, there is no information about this married couple on the internet. You can check phone directories, databases, marriage registrations, and other sources, but you won't find Martha or Jackson Wright. You won't find their friends or relatives. That's strange, but what about the police? The case of the disappearance of Martha Wright is quite famous, after all. Some big newspapers wrote about it. Perhaps someone's even covered it on TV. But if you search for it, you will soon find that the information about Martha Wright is basically the same on all websites. It's a small column without any additional information. If you search on Google Books, you'll find one result. A book describing mystical tales with no evidence. Reading it, it really just feels like someone just took all of the world's most famous urban legends and put them together on one page. Well, there you go. Looks like we found our answer. Martha Wright didn't disappear because she never really existed. But don't give the credit to me. I'm not the genius who solved this. To find the answer, I visited the greatest detective community in the world, Reddit users. They solved the mystery of Martha's disappearance long ago and shared it with everyone. Okay, here's a rhetorical question. Why did reputable newspapers publish an article about Martha Wright? And this wouldn't be the only time either. This story is similar to another famous case about a young guy who was walking through a field near his farm and just vanished into thin air. His family and friends saw it with their own eyes. This story appeared in several films and TV shows about mystical phenomena without any evidence or details. What's the point of making it up? Well, to sell copies. People like these kinds of riddles. People can be strangely captivated by the prospect of the unknown. One of the most popular fake mysteries was about the Pan Am Flight 914. This plane took off in 1955 from New York and then disappeared from all radars. It was supposed to arrive in Florida a few hours later, but it landed at the airport in Venezuela 37 years later. Another case, 1954. Santiago Airlines Flight 513 took off from an airport in West Germany. The plane was due to land in Brazil in 18 hours. There were 88 passengers and four crew members on board. The plane disappeared from the sky and from the radar. Air traffic controllers tried contacting the pilots, but didn't receive any response. 18 hours later, they called the airport in Brazil. Those dispatchers couldn't confirm the plane's landing. They couldn't contact it either. The plane did eventually land on October 12, 1989. It was in perfect condition, but none of the passengers had survived. These stories seem unrelated to each other, but they do have two things in common. First, you won't find a list of passengers or employees. You'll also find that those dispatches from the 50s and 80s didn't exist either. Second, you'll find that both of these stories were actually published in the same newspaper, one known for its tall tales and fake news. Once again, there is nothing mystical about these cases. But we have gotten to the truth. And now we know a lot more about how to evaluate information critically. The next time you hear about some girl seeing a flying monster near a rock festival or some guy disappearing from his pool, don't just believe it right away. Try to study the details, check the sources. As a rule, these kinds of fantastical stories fall apart if you look at them just a little more closely. The real world is complicated and mysterious, but it is by no means impossible to understand. You just need to think critically and pay attention to the details.
That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. 